Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give everyone just a minute or two to get on before we get started. <clears throat> Okay, looks like we still have some people trickling in, but we can go ahead and get started and go over some housekeeping. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're very excited to have you all here. Um, unfortunately, we are having um, some difficulties with our cameras. So the video is not working and today it will just be our voices. So we thank you for bearing with us on that. Um, so for some housekeeping rules and just the FYIs. Um, so we are um, going to be going over a whole lot of information today. So if you will um, wait until after the presentation, we encourage questions. Um, we heavily encourage you to use the question and answer feature, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can go in there and type questions in at any point in the presentation. Um, you can also use the raise hand feature um, if you would like to ask your question um, out loud. And um, if you are on your phone, if you dial star nine, that will let us know that we, um, we can unmute your line so that you can ask a question. Um, we do have closed captioning available to you. At the bottom of your screen, there will be a little icon that says CC. Um, for closed captioning. If you click on that, you will be able to see closed captioning. Um, this webinar is being recorded and we will have it up on the website, um, hopefully in the next couple weeks. Um, along with the recording of the webinar, there will also be a transcript at that point that is available to you as well. Um, and if you have any questions after, the webinar, feel free to email those questions to cbdataTeam at acf.hhs.gov. And today we will have several presenters um, from the Division of Performance Measurement and Improvement. We will have the Director Jennifer Haight and um, Malcolm Hale, and then from the Office on Child Abuse and Neglect, we will have Kara Kelly and Dory Snedden here. Um, and with that, I will pass it to Jennifer. Thanks, Amber. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, we've been looking forward to this uh, webinar and um, uh, conversation or written conversation with you all for some time. Uh, we we decided to have this right now, particularly because we were focusing on the experience of those jurisdictions that, who were in the first cohort of Family First Prevention data submitters and those who are um, coming up right behind them. Those who were in the first cohort of submitters are currently right now in their second reporting period where they're getting ready to submit information for the 2022 B period, while those who are in the cohort behind them, those jurisdictions that need to submit in the next spring are just beginning to collect data for um, the current fiscal year, fiscal year 23 or the 23 A period. Uh, we wanted to take some afternoon time this afternoon to talk with you today because um, uh, we want to give a quick overview of the program, although we think most folks are familiar with the, the program at this point, um, and the data submission requirements. 
and take advantage of the opportunity we have had over the past several months to review the information that was submitted, to review the use of the new National Child Welfare Data Management System, and to meet with the jurisdictions that were in the post first cohort of submitters, to hear from them um, and to observe for ourselves any challenges or opportunities to clarify the the methods and the expectations for data submission. And from those conversations comes not only this, this presentation today, but also some clarifications in the technical bulletin one that outlines the data elements that you are required to submit. That technical bulletin update is live today and it's posted now on the CB website. We'll drop into the chat a link for you. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the time today, we want to uh, go over the program briefly, talk about the lessons we've learned, share with you what we've put in the update and hear from uh, updated technical bulletin, and then hear from you any questions or clarifications we can offer. So again, thanks for joining and I'm gonna turn it over to Kara Kelly. Kara? Thanks, Jennifer. Before we get more into the weeds related to the data submission and lessons learned, we wanted to provide you all with some high level context around the data collection requirement and some details related to the timing of data submission. The Title IV Prevention Services data collection effort is really one component of the larger Family First legislation, and it's just a single component of each agency's Title IV prevention program. The data collection is authorized by Family First, that among many other things, reauthorized Title IV-B subparts one and two of the Social Security Act and created a new Title IV-E prevention services program. Related to states' prevention programs, the legislation also included new optional funding under Title IV-E, including that beginning back in October of 2019, states and tribes that have an approved prevention plan have the option to claim for Title IV-E for a portion of programs and services for eligible children and families that fall into the categories of mental health, substance use, and in-home parent skill-based programs and services. Next slide. So we now have had our first group of states submit their first set of data from their Title III prevention program. For states that are reporting for the first time, the Children's Bureau has allowed a bit of a runway that is outlined on this table here to allow time to prepare for data collection and submission. Specifically, for states and tribes must begin collecting data starting one full federal fiscal year following the fiscal year that their plan was approved. So to be very clear, states and tribes will have the remainder of the fiscal year during which their agency's prevention plan was approved and the following fiscal year to prepare. The table here provides some examples based on the federal fiscal year of approval. So for states and tribes approved at any point in federal fiscal year 2021, the data collection should have recently begun in the month of October of 2022, and transition of data, transmission of data to the Children's Bureau should begin in April of 23. So the same follow-up occurs for states that are approved at any point in federal fiscal year 22, where data collection should begin in October of 23, with transmission occurring in April of 24. And then finally, for states with upcoming potential approvals in federal fiscal year 23, data collection should begin in October of 24 and transmission should occur in April of 25. Next slide. The data submission occurs every six months with a transmission period of 45 days. So the two six month data collection periods are based on the federal fiscal year. So as a result, the first data collection period occurs from October through March 31st, and the file is then due to the Children's Bureau by May 15th. The second data collection period is from April 1st through September 30th, and the file for this period is due by November 14th. And we've set up a number of automated reminders through Nicodemus, which is the interface that'll be used to transmit files to CB. So for established users, you'll get reminders approximately one month prior to the submission deadline, two weeks prior, and the final day that submissions are due. And then after the submission has been received, the state and tribal contacts will receive a letter to confirm 
that the CB data team has successfully received your submission. Next slide. Okay. And this slide provides an example of the ongoing data submission dates using the first group of states that submitted files in May 22 as a demonstration. So for these states, the first data collection period occurred from October 1st, 21 until March 31st, 22, with the first transmission occurring between April 1st, 22 and May 15th, 22. The second data collection period occurred from April 1st until September 30th of this year, with the transmission period that began October 1st of this year, it will be open until November 14th. The data collection period after that began on October 1st and will continue until March 23, with the data transmission period occurring from April 1st, 23 until May 15th, 23. So the data collection and data submission dates are overlapping. However, data collection is continuous with a cumulative file. So I'm now gonna go ahead and turn it over to Malcolm from the data team for some more specifics related to the file structure and file submission. Next slide. Um, Car, I think this slide was also yours actually. So this information here on this slide um, shows here where you can find some of the resources. And so I believe that we're gonna dump the technical bulletin link here in the chat, um, but the submission for the file here will be an XML file and the schema is available here on the Children's Bureau's website. So the arrow here um, that's highlighted pretty large, it highlights the schema here where you can find it. The technical bulletin there that's been revised um, is the link above that. And so again, like I said, we're gonna put this in the chat so for you to have easier access to it. Yep, it was just put in the chat. Great, thanks Malcolm. Um, hello everyone. Um, well, first off, I hope nothing on this slide comes as a surprise to anyone from the list of states and tribes. Um, on the right side of the slide, we have listed the agencies who are a little less than six months away from submitting their first family first data file. Um, and on the left side of the slide, we've listed all the agencies that have already started to submit their family first data. Next slide. And sort of as a result of the first set of submissions, there were some lessons learned that we wanted to make sure that at least the upcoming agencies were aware of. Um, the first bullet point here is not actually a lesson learned, it's more of a general comment. Uh, we wanted to note that 4E agencies can resubmit their data at any time. If you do resubmit your data, we ask you to put something in the commentary box about why you're resubmitting your data, you know, i.e. what was wrong with it, what you might have fixed between the original version and the new version you're uploading now. Um, and that's just helpful context for us when we get the resubmissions in. Um, so starting with the first actual lesson learned, um, we want to acknowledge there's going to be some difficulty in mapping services provided to a caregiver, to a home, to a family, um, back to an individual child. Uh, this is unfortunately, however, a necessity. The, the law talks about prevention plans on a per-child basis and reporting is defined on a per-child basis. Um, so, you know, so the exercise on how to divide costs provided to caregivers, families, homes, this sort of left up to the individual agencies. But we did want to share that uh, so far, states are usually just using sort of a, sorry, a proportional split um, between potentially multiple children that could have received the same service. There were certain aspects of the XML schema and TB number one, which were also unclear. And there was at least one error that I found. So we have updated TB number one. That's the link that was dropped in the chat. Um, and that's available on the website now. We also wanted to include a reminder to log in to Nicodemus early so you can orient yourself on the system before submission period, before the submission period sort of starts coming to an end. Um, in particular, you need to set up multi-factor authentication uh, to get into the system. Next slide. So 
So one of the issues that arose um, across states is that service provision is not set up in a way to allow uh, reporting of data on a child, um, per child basis. Uh, another issue that sort of came up is around staff turnover. Um, you know, for the agency, that could mean a loss of institutional knowledge on sort of the family first uh, services data process. And perhaps a bigger issue is in staff turnover and service providers. You know, we, they have the same sort of issue where they lose someone who has the knowledge of the, the what and how of the reporting um, can lead to issues. But in addition, there was a lot of problems observed with sort of service providers not having sufficient staff to provide services, resulting in children who were referred not receiving services. I mean, in some cases, sort of being captured in the data system still and sent back to us where the cost is zero. Um, next slide. Another issue that arose was the need to make sure there's conversations occurring uh, between the program staff and IT staff. You know, the Family First Services data collection is a very small data collection. It's 15 data elements, but it still requires gathering a lot of information as well. It requires gathering information from service providers, you know, ingesting that somehow into your system, even if you don't read it directly into your CWIS, it still has to be accessible by your CWIS. You know, at the end of the day, you have to create an XML file to upload um, for us. Um, so sort of making sure there's conversations going on between the IT staff and program staff is very important to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, one of the suggestions, particularly as you get towards the end, is to sort of produce some basic reports on what you do have and review it with both the program staff and IT staff to make sure that everyone is getting, you know, the data that is there that you are expecting. You know, likewise, thoughts should be given pretty early on how to make sure that data can be extracted from legacy systems. You know, identify how you go, how you're going to identify pregnant and parenting youth in foster care within your sort of legacy system is sort of something you need to handle early on. Otherwise, you may end up getting to the point where you can only report the candidates for foster care, at least for the first couple data submissions. Next slide. Um, and we did see some data quality challenges that arose um, at least so far. Uh, the first is in just checking the ages of the candidates for foster care and pregnant and parenting youth in your submission. Uh, in some cases, sort of 18 year old and ups are fine. That's usually a result of having extended foster care in your state. However, we were seeing some ages that suggest a caregiver or similar was making their way into their data, you know, a date of birth that makes them about 35 years old. Another thing we were seeing is um, if a child enters foster care, they are no longer a candidate for entry into foster care. So the prevention plan must end. And since the prevention plan has ended, for the purposes of the um, Family First Services data collection, there should be no services reported after that entry to foster care. So again, to clarify, that does not mean the services themselves have to stop, but they should no longer be reported in the, the Family First Prevention Services data. And that may require sort of calculations of cost to make sure that the cost reflects the period up to the entry to foster care. Um, another one is that prevention plans are defined as lasting 12 months in order to continue providing services after 12 months. A new prevention plan should be started after the first one has finished. This does require the artificial ending of the first prevention plan Oh, sorry, the artificial ending of the service in the first prevention plan and the artificial start date in the second prevention plan, you know, ended on the last day of the first prevention plan and beginning it on the first day of the next prevention plan. Um, it also would require sort of some necessary splitting of cost data between the two prevention plans too, depending on where it fell. Um, and the last one, sir, we have listed here is to clarify the nature of element 13, which asks about foster care status at 12 months, and that is, to clarify the foster care status exactly at 12 months in the future from when the prevention plan started, which is to say, are they in foster care on the exact day that is 12 months from the prevention plan start date? Not, did they enter within 12 months? So if 12 months has elapsed, there should not be any data in that field. Um, you know, we I think we've traditionally said, mark that as null, but for an XML file, that usually also means sort of open and close the element and put nothing between the two bags. I'm sort of not listed here is also an issue where the same child ID shows up more than once on different prevention plans, which logically doesn't make any sense, i.e. 
the same child has a prevention plan that starts on the same day um, multiple times. Um, so sort of just double checking your data for that sort of situation and then uh, reconciling it before you start sending it in. Okay, next slide. And sort of as a result of these listening sessions, which we've had with the states and sort of answering the questions, um, we really, <laughs> we thought it was best to revise technical bolts in one. Um, in doing so, we sort of captured, well, we added the data quality rules that are currently being run on Nicodemus. So you can look at them in technical bolts in number one before you start uploading a file and getting data quality results back, uh, Nicodemus being the system that has been designed to ingest the family first services data and the upcoming AFGARS data collection. We also added um, a fair number of visuals to sort of help clarify what services and cost data to report and what foster care data to report across multiple timeframes. Um, so I would definitely take a look at that if you're unsure you know, how to report if a child entered foster care and thus is no longer a candidate. Um, likewise, there's a visual for the case where a, a second prevention plan is needed and the service crosses both prevention plans. Um, finally, we also provided clarifications around what I just talked about already for foster care element number 13. Um, sorry, element 13, which is the foster care status at 12 months, and also a more general clarification on what we mean by null. But I think that's a, a general overview of some of the lessons learned um, we've seen so far. So if we go to the next slide, I believe we're opening it up to questions. So I will just note that we haven't seen any questions in the chat or the Q&A, although one just came in. Um, oh, and now there's one in the, in both, uh, both relate to element 13, I think, um, Malcolm. So I'm gonna read the first question. Element 13 is foster care status at 12 months. If the child entered out of home care, but exited before 12 months, they are not in out of home care on the 12th month. So is that a no? That would be correct, assuming they don't re-enter to foster care, which I think is implied. Yes, so if they enter and then exit before that 12th month occurs, that would be a no for 13. That would be a yes for 14, which is within 24 months, not at 24 months. So 14 would be a yes once that happens, and then you would put the date in for 14A which is the element that collects the uh, dates of entry to foster. Right. I think that answered both questions. That did, that answered both questions. That was, there was a question both in the chat and the Q&A on that. Okay, thanks, Audrey. Um, I'm not at the moment seeing any other questions. Oh. I just have to say that and then one comes in. I, I'm going to ask that people put the questions in the question and answer box and not the chat box. Okay. They, unfortunately, there's no easy way to sort of just move one from one to the other. Um, okay, so there is a question right now that I'll read in the chat. If a service is approved for multiple domains, for example, VSFT is approved for parenting, mental health, and substance abuse, would that service be encoded as a yes to 9A, 9C, and 9B? Malcolm. So if I remember correctly, it's sort of a yes with an asterisk. So a service can be approved in the clearinghouse under multiple uh, domains, but in the state plan, and Cara can correct me if I'm wrong here, or Dory, the state plan itself also indicates how they plan to use a service. And so it's sort of your response, it should be restricted to that, but even in the individual child service plan, it should indicate what sort of, what domains it's gonna qualify for when you provide it. Um, 
So if you're providing BFT, BSFT for a particular child and it falls under all the domains, then yes, you would indicate a yes for 9A, 9B, and 9C. Okay, so um, I see that Kara Riley has a question that she thinks might be easier to say. So I'm asking that she get unmuted or you can see if you can unmute yourself. Um, while we wait for that, there is a question. Is there a list or time frame as to when each state must submit data? So we'll be posting the PowerPoint, um, but the the there is not a list per se. When your data submission is due depends on when your approval, when you received your approval, and that's uh, the fiscal year that you received your approval, and then you must submit data in um, the CARA second full fiscal year following the approval date. There's a table in technical bulletin two that describes that. And there are also some examples in this PowerPoint when it gets posted. But um, Kara, if you wanna clarify anything I said. Or yeah, but that's, that's correct. We don't have a, a table of when all the states are gonna be submitting that's publicly available. Um, but moving forward for states that have not yet um, received a, approval, the date for when your state will be required to submit data will be included as part of the approval letter as well. And if states have questions, states or tribes have questions about when their data is due for their jurisdiction, you can always follow up with your regional office specialist to clarify. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to mark that as answered. Um, there's Kara, are you able to ask your question? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, I just had, I wanted to clarify, uh, to clarify a question I had. So if for whatever reason, um, a prevention plan service um, lasts past the 12 month mark, a new prevention plan start date happens to kind of start that next 12 month period. Um, would that child then possibly have two entries under the same reporting period? And then for the 12 month and 24 month mark for foster care, um, would the timelines then start over for each prevention plan start date? Amber, can you go to slide 24, which is a hidden slide? to warn you. Okay, while she's doing that, I'll say that that question, is, we're hoping that the clarification on those questions is, um, or so, I'll say it this way, we tried to clarify your exact question in some of the changes we've made in technical bulletin one. And I think that um, uh, with some images, and I think that's what Malcolm is about to show you, if I'm guessing correctly. So stand by for one second. In the meantime, there was a question about what kind of timeline there is for penalties as states are getting a handle on this. And what, there are no penalties associated with this data submission. There is, however, a fairly long runway between when you get approval and when, you're, um, when your data submission is expected. And uh, one of the, we, are more than happy to work with you if you want to reach out to us through the CB Data Team mailbox to help you troubleshoot uh, and develop your approach to collecting and submitting this information if that's helpful to you. And I will just put that, our email in the chat as well. Okay, Malcolm, are you gonna go over this slide? Yeah, sorry, I was giving um, Amber a second to click on current slide. Figure eight shows two sequential prevention plans. It consists of a series of adjacent boxes designed to represent consecutive six month prevention program data collection periods. The solid green line shows a sample prevention plan for a candidate for entry into foster care that starts on January 1st, 2022 and ends on December 31st, 2022, 12 months later. The solid orange line shows another prevention plan for the same child starting on January 1st, 2023 and ending on December 31st, 2023. 
Both prevention plans depicted also have separate foster care follow-up periods. The dotted green line shows the first prevention plan's follow-up period ending up December 31, 2023, 24 months after its associated prevention plan started. The dotted orange shows the first prevention plan's follow-up period ending up December 31, 2024, 24 months after its associated prevention plan started. The thick solid line represents a service that starts as part of the first prevention plan but continues into the second prevention plan. Since the first prevention plan ends on December 31, 2022, data on this service, provided up to that date, should be included as part of the first prevention plan. Data on this service that were provided after December 31, 2022, should be included as part of the second prevention plan. So we try to sort of produce a visual that should help explain the expectations around sort of the overlap, or not overlapping, sorry, um, back-to-back prevention plans. You know, each prevention plan has its own foster, what we, we called a foster care follow-up period. Um, so you would report the foster care information for under each plan. Um, so each one would have its own at 12 months, exactly 12 months later, you know, what happened? Each one would have its own within 24 months, did a child enter foster care, and if so, what their dates are. That unfortunately does occasionally result in a date having to be reported on both plans. Um, and you can sort of see what I was talking about in terms of splitting the cost of the service and sort of ending it on one end, beginning it on the other. It's sort of the green part of the, the thick center bar represents the portion of the service in which the cost start date and end date should be, prefer- should be reported on the first prevention plan. Sort of the orange thick bar represents the start end date and cost of the service that should be reported under the second prevention plan. Um, I don't remember that answers all of the original question or not. But I hope so. Yes, this visual um, definitely helps out with that. Thank you. Um, there is okay. another question that says for element 11, if we paid $500 in period A, but nothing in period B, would both periods show 500 or would only period A show 500 and period B show zero? Um, the intention is that it would be the cost for the service from sort of the beginning to end. So there would be 500 under both A to B. Um, I think that's actually hopefully clarified in another um, earlier example. So, you know, if you want to use the example we have on the um, the screen now, the, so the costs accrued from sort of the beginning of the thick orange bar to the first time it crosses over from a dark gray to a light gray box, that would be what you would report in the first reporting period for that plan. During the sort of the end of the light box in the middle, which I think is October 1st, 2023, you would report the start and end date and all the costs that accrued between that start and end date. So from the beginning of the thick orange bar all the way up to October 1st, 2023. And then sort of in the fine, the third reporting period, you report the total cost of that service from the start to end date, you know, entirely within that. Um, okay, thanks, Malcolm. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or in, which is good, <laughs> or in the Q&A. And I don't see any raised hands, so um, we'll, I'll just take a minute to see if folks have further questions or anything else we can offer assistance with related to the um, prevention plan, Dana. And then if not, I think we'll turn it to Amber to close us out. Okay, hearing no more questions, I will close this out and just say that um, we appreciate your attending today. We hope um, that if that you will continue to be in touch, I dropped the CB data team um, mailbox into the chat, which we do monitor regularly. A lot of questions do come in through the chat and we use them, we provide direct answers or we use them to help clarify our own instructions in uh, such, in either the way we uh, provide TA directly to the states in technical bulletins 
or the feedback we give to the Nicodemus team. For now, we just want to show you, let you know where there are currently resources available on the uh, CB website site. There's a link to the T Title 40 Prevention Program itself. There too are the two technical bulletins we've talked about today. Mostly we talked about technical bulletin one, which as we said, was recently revised to clarify some of the um, information related to data elements based on what we observed and heard from the first set of uh, jurisdictions uploading their data. And then technical bulletin two, which provides a little more information about uh, the reporting periods. So please do continue to be in touch. You, we are eager to support you as you embark on this data collection, and we're looking forward to hearing from you and uh, reviewing the data that, get, that gets sent in. I think that's it. So um, thank you again for your attention. I think we can go to the last slide where we repeat our mailbox information, and we are happy to give you back some more time in your day. Thanks, everyone.